Welcome back guys, it's time for another great video and a very overdue video because as it turns out I've been playing with this deck in its modified form from the original for like a month or two and I haven't updated the original video. In fact, there's really no way to update a video on YouTube, so I don't know why that is, why they think that's not important, so I just made a new video. <laughs> so why not? Better mic anyway, who cares? So this is SEAL Team 6 version 2. Today I looked up all the cards that I had listed as options for this deck and made the final determination on how this deck should be configured. I just tweaked it a little bit, moved some cards to the sideboard and that sort of thing. But uh, overall it has the exact same strategy, it's just stronger and more consistent. So I'm going to run down uh, what's left in the deck now. The first creature in the deck is Anafenza Kintree Spirit. She's a 2-2 two, two for 2, and she causes a bolster to occur whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield. So, in almost every case, it is the creature that came out onto the battlefield with this deck. So, double strikers that come out with a counter on them already are pretty nice, um, but that's actually not why she's in the deck. She's really, really, really important to the math of the deck, and that's where it gets really weird. It's going to totally blow your mind, but I'll Get to that later. Next up, we've got a creature that I absolutely hate having in the deck. It's double white, which is downright annoying, with one colorless, so it's a three cost, and it's a one one double strike flyer. Who cares about Mega Morph? It'll never happen in this deck. So I really wish it was like a two one, even a one two, I would take, or cost two, or anything other than what it is right now. This is just. Me looking for another white double striker, pretty much. So, not a fan of that card. I would replace it in a heartbeat if there was something better. So, uh, watch the future sets for any type of white double striker that's better. Now, the one upside is that uh, I have one solely because this card is flying. I mean, if you use Become Immense on it once, you've got 14 damage in the air that they probably can't stop. And that is no joke. Uh, but let's move on to Fabled Hero, the absolute king of the deck. He costs three as well, but who cares because he's a 2-2 natural double striker with Heroic. So Heroic goes off even if you target him with a spell and then the spell gets cancelled, you still have the Heroic trigger on the stack and it still occurs because of the whole reverse order thing. So that's fantastic. I mean, if you so much as target him with like a pro color spell, boom, now he's a 3-3, that's six damage, and then he's getting through, then you can boost him. So he really is the win on turn for a guy in this deck um i wish they would print like some other version of him but i mean really a 2-2 on the ground three cost double white double striker with heroic that's a little specific <laughs> speaking of that here's his cousin fencing ace uh that's a 1-1 double striker for two and that's actually just really important to have pretty much anything with double strike that costs two so he's really really important to the deck as well and finally, we've got Mirren Crusader from the recent Modern Masters 2015 set. He does cost 3, and he's a 2-2 with double strike, so he's very strong, but I actually do and do not like the fact that he's got permanent protection from black and green. Primarily green, because as you know, this deck likes to boost creatures with green, so all my green spells, I can't target him with. That's kind of a problem, just a little bit. But he is very powerful, and he will just shred a Tarmogoyf, so... You know, whatever. I guess he's immune to black kill spells too. Like, I guess dismember. I mean, that doesn't really come up much. So he's just there to be another creature because this is too sensitive to creature removal and I just needed more of them. Now, you may have noticed that Anna Fenza is double white, Fabled Hero is double white, Evan Sunstriker is double white, and Mirren Crusader is double white. That's why there's not a whole lot of green creatures in this deck. There's actually zero in case you didn't catch that. Um, so the mana is like 75 to 80% white, and then it's got just a splash of green, because you usually only need one green mana the entire game. So uh, the whole let's make it 50-50 and throw in the best of green, maybe throw in a green creature, maybe like a trample, it just doesn't really work um you, you'd end up getting two color screwed well that's it for creatures so let's move on to spells and the spells really come in two forms protection and boost although there is some crossover and i'll explain that later First up, we've got Brave the Elements for a mere one white mana. You can cast this as an instant on your turn or their turn, so very flexible. You choose a color, then white creatures you control, which is why it's all white creatures, uh, gain protection from the chosen color until end of turn. So if you don't know how pro colors works, basically there's three functions to this card. You can make your creatures effectively unblockable. You can use it to ambush as a block or ambush after swinging, because then your creatures can't take damage from the given color source, or you can 
can save them from a, a removal spell, kill spell, pretty much any type of targeted spell at all. You know, especially them trying to steal your creature, which isn't that common in modern. So I just absolutely love this card. It's an uncommon. I think it was an M14. It's really simple to get, really cheap, and it's just perfect for the deck. And there's a secret to this card that I will get into later. And then the only other pro spell, because uh, if you're paying attention to the original configuration, Feet of Resistance was in there, but I took it out. Uh, the only one remaining is God's Willing, which is also a one cost. Target creature you control. Uh, so unfortunately you can't, you know, pop auras off of the enemy creatures with this, but hey. Uh, gains protection of color from your er, protection from the color of your choice until the end of turn, and then scry one, which is really useful for this deck because it needs to work properly to kill somebody on turn four, which it really does quite often, and if it doesn't, it absolutely is going to kill them on turn five. And, of course, that's a targeted spell for heroic purposes, and so are pretty much the rest of these. So, let's move on to the green boost spells, of which there are three remaining. So, let's start with the newest edition, Mutagenic Growth. And, of course, it has Frexian Mana, so you can pay two life or one green. So, if for some reason you're color screwed and you just can't get green, which would be really weird in this deck, you could just pay two life, or if you're tapped completely out and they think they've got you, and they launch a, let's say, a... Well, Lightning Bolt. <laughs> I was trying to think. Yeah, what would they use? Duh, Lightning Bolt. Everybody uses Lightning Bolt. So they want a Lightning Bolt Fabled Hero. Boom, now he's a 5-5 because of the targeting, uh, because of Heroic. But uh, yeah, he gets plus 2, plus 2 till end of turn. So you can save quite a few creatures with this. I mean, a lot of them have one toughness, and then you cannot target the guy with pro green because he can't be targeted by green spells. So a little bit less than ideal, but... If you needed a little bit of extra oomph on top of the other spells, you could cast this for zero, and that is what's important. Next up, we've got the sneakiest ambush ever made, Become Immense. I love this card. It normally costs six, but you can delve it down to one by paying the five generic mana cost with uh, exiling cards out of your graveyard. Now, if you need some bonus cards in your graveyard, one, get Anaphensa killed on purpose, two, cast God's Willing for no reason, three, cast Brave the Elements for no reason with no valid target, um, or four, fetch lands. So your graveyard's gonna fill up a lot faster than the average deck if you need it to. So if this is already in your hand and you have Brave the Elements and God's Willing, on turn one, cast Brave the Elements and just ditch it into your graveyard. Maybe turn two, maybe turn three. Um, but on turn three, you should be bringing out a three cost so you wouldn't have bonus mana. So if you're counting ahead and you're thinking, I got to get to six between my lands and my graveyard as quickly as possible, preferably turn four, then you want to start ditching Brave the Elements into the graveyard or God's Willing. But you don't want to be left without one single pro card because you might have to get that guy through and you don't want to use this as an ambush or you're going to burn yourself out and never hit their life total and you'll give them extra turns to remove your creatures so nothing good will happen if that whole backfiring situation happens but become immense of course if you're not familiar is plus six plus six or in double strike terms plus 12 plus six <laughs> i really 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 like this card i really like this deck this deck is just so outrageously stupid and almost every single card was printed in the last two and a half years believe it or not Next up, we've got one of my favorite spells of all time with this beautiful set of protection and boost spells. Wouldn't it be great if there was a protection boost spell? Well, there is. Well, actually, there's multiple, come to think of it. A whole bunch of them just popped in my mind. But the particular one that I'm going with is Vines of Vastwood because it's basically titanic growth with an upside or an additional perk, I guess you would say. There's not really a downside to Titanic Growth. But um, I really love it because it's a common, so no problem getting it. Um, it was recently printed in Modern Masters uh, 2015, so now there's really no problem getting it. And uh, you can cast it for one if you absolutely needed to. So whether you cast it for one or two, the target creature can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control this turn. If Vines of Aspen was kicked, so if you pay two for it, that creature gets plus four, plus four till end of turn. So basically, if you kick it, it turns into Titanic Growth. But then it still gets that first ability that goes off no matter what. Or not ability, effect. Now, the one ruling about this card is hilarious. It starts with the phrase, this is different than Hexproof. Because keep in mind, this is different than Hexproof. They really want you to know that. Here's a great example of how this works, although you uh, smart people watching this probably already figured it out. Let's say you're playing a mirror match, because that'll totally happen. Uh, and they're swinging at you with Fencing Ace. Oh boy, it's a 1-1 one, one double striker, no problem, let's let it through, because 2 damage is nothing to this deck. Oh, and then they become immense it. 
all you have to do is in response, Cass finds a vast wood, really just for one. I mean, you really wouldn't want to do it for two and give him the boost. So you'd actually want to purposely cast it for one, for sure. But, oh no, target creature can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control this turn. So what happens is this goes on the stack above Become Immense. So Become Immense successfully targets the creature. Then your spell goes above it. Your spell resolves first, and then the secondary targeting check of the Become Immense spell goes off at resolution time, and it checks, oops, it's no longer a valid target, spell fizzles. So you actually do have to target every spell twice, once at uh, cast time and once at resolution time. There are a couple exceptions to this, but um, the majority of the time that's how it works. It's how the rules are actually written. So you would prevent a spell from going off, um, this does not kick off auras like protection would, but you could prevent the aura from being attached in the first place. In fact, you could prevent like a creature from being bestowed because I believe that's also considered targeting. So it's a very, very, very flexible spell for sure. Now the lands in this deck are pretty obvious. Four Windswept Heath, which is the Fetch Land, and four Temple Gardens, which is the Shock Land. So if you need to fix green on turn five before you do your big swing or something, yeah, you're going to want to shock yourself. <laughs> and the Windswept Heath can be used to fetch the Temple Garden, so it's your typical, you know, fetch and shock combination. So I don't really like that combination because it loses you life and you treat your life total like it's trivial. And in this deck, it kind of isn't, but it kind of is because it's going to win so quick. Quickly. So definitely a proper appropriate trade-off. And then, believe it or not, there's actually 15 planes and one forest because that's just all you need. There just doesn't need to be two forests. Plus, I used to play this with two forests and I would end up with at least one, if not both of them, in my opening hand every damn time. I mean, my luck is just legendary at my LGS for pulling off stunts that would normally be well beyond the realm of just a bad luck enthusiast, like an amateur bad luck person. But uh, I'm at the advanced level of bad luck, so th stuff like that happens to me all the time. I don't know if you guys heard of my other video. I pulled 10 basic lands off the top of my deck in a game. 10 of them. I mean, that's... Uh, how did I even live that long? Like, why was the game still going is my real question. But uh, I did the math. It's, it's like one in a trillion, somewhere around there. And I still can't win the Powerball. And yes, I shuffled the deck. So, sparing Desolator level bad luck, you're probably going to win with this deck. It's just so unbelievably fast, and the way I describe it is if they slip up once, they are dead. Simple as that. I mean, if they let a creature through because they thought, oh, I could take two damage, boom, it's 20 damage, you're dead. I mean, it's just so stupidly unforgiving, and then nobody knows what's in the deck. I mean, they'd be like, oh, cool, he's going for some kind of white aggro i guess maybe something with counters and bolster maybe he's gonna try to swarm me i don't really know what's going on and then boom next turn they're dead just like that so uh that's always fun until people catch on and uh believe it or not people have not caught on to this deck because i keep playing beholder <laughs> so still have a little bit of um traction out of this deck i guess so I have a special message for anybody visiting from MTG Salvation who seem to have a problem with me calling this deck Tier 2 even though it wins on turn 4 consistently, it can beat the majority of what's out there. This is a Tier 2 deck. I don't need some douchebags on a forum to tell me that this is Tier 2. I know how to do math and I know how to play Magic and this is a Tier 2 deck. I mean, it fits every single definition of one. So the fact that this barely costs anything and there's barely anybody playing it does not play a factor. This wins on turn four, the end. It is resilient to control and it can beat any kind of combo deck. It just shredded Splinter Twin because it's more consistent and more quick. There's more combinations of cards instead of just waiting for one of four cards. It doesn't even need Scry or Draw Control. It just doesn't. And then it has it in God's Willing. So this deck is absolutely flawless. The only thing that I would improve is replacing Anafenza with another double striker or replacing Avin Sunstriker with a better double striker, but they just don't exist yet. So as time goes on when they print better cards, this deck is going to become absolutely elite. Now at the end I like to throw in a real quick uh, user's manual, but this one gets kind of complicated, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through it and hopefully you'll follow along. So there's two ways to play it. Um, what you want to do is throw out a creature as soon as you possibly can. If you have two mana, throw out a Fencing Ace or an Anafenza, obviously. And if you have three mana, throw out an Avon Sunstriker, a Fabled Hero, or a Mirren Crusader. So you want to get the creatures out first, get them on the field. Now, if you have three mana and you spend all of it on a Fabled Hero, 
and then they blow them away because you're tapped out, you are set so far back that you may never recover. They basically just won the game if they can wipe out your first, maybe, or for sure your second creature. So if you know that they're going extremely removal heavy, or if you suspect that that's what they sideboarded in, you're definitely going to want to wait until you get to 4 or 5 mana. Which brings me to why this deck is 61 cards and why it has 23 lands. Um, usually going above 60 in a modern deck is like the worst thing you could possibly do, but mathematically there is one condition and only one condition under which you would want to go above 60, and that's if you took a 60 card deck and added one land to it, which is what I did. So you look, I mean, if you look at the deck list, you can't pull anything from it. You just can't pull one of these cards. The ratios would be so far off. So the ratio and the probability of pulling any individual card that's important when you need it is less if you go to 61 because of a land than if you pull one of them and replace it with a land and keep it 60. So there's less of an impact on the deck um, the, I guess malfunction rate, malfunction probability by going to 61. And people are going to say I'm wrong. They're going to say you should never go to 61. But trust me, I did all the math. It took like 30 minutes. I charted it all out. Just go to 61 and get it over with. If you're absolutely obsessed with playing with 60 cards for some reason, I guess you could just cut it down to 22 lands. <laughs> just go down one planes or something. But I really, really, really wouldn't recommend it because if you don't get to four land, you are going to die. And uh, preferably on turn four would be nice. And then with the fetch lands, you're already thinning out the land in the deck. So, I mean, if I had my way, I'd go up to like 26, but then that would kind of ruin all the math in the entire deck. It would be like 65 cards. That wouldn't quite be a good idea. The math kind of falls apart even at 62, technically. I'm sure somebody's in the comment section typing, what about Battle of Wits? Yeah, shut up about Battle of Wits. I hate that card. Anyway, after you've got your creature out, the very next turn you try to win. Uh, that's almost always how it works, because if they use fetch lands and shock lands for like some kind of thought sees that they thought was clever, and then they look at your hand and they have no idea what your deck does, and really doesn't serve any purpose other than losing them to life. Oh, and then they used a fetch to bring in a shock. Well, now they're down to below 16, and they're just, they're going to get hit for 16. So it's very, very easy to plan out to become immense, like I said, by throwing cards purposely into the graveyard. Now, here's where Anafenza comes into play. Well, if she comes into play, let's say. So you put her into play on turn two. Uh, on turn three, swing with her no matter what. No matter what they have out, no matter what's going on, swing with her. If they say, oh, I'm at 18, who cares, I'll go down to 16. I'll take the hit from this crappy little creature. Okay, now they're at 16, so you're going to win. If they block her and kill her and put her in the graveyard, now you can cast Become Immense one turn sooner, and they just killed themselves earlier. So no matter what they do, they just killed themselves one turn earlier. So as long as she's on the battlefield, you're good. Now, if they let her through and she does two damage, the next double striker that comes out is going to get bolstered, which is an additional two damage, so that means you can win with just Vines of Vastwood if it's Fabled Hero. So there's all these, like, branched what's going to happen on turn two, three, and four, where you can think, okay, throw this into the graveyard, and that's equivalent to a mana, and then if I didn't pull a land, then Anna Fenza needs to be in the graveyard, or I need to do two damage with her, or I actually do need the bolster because I'm stuck with two fencing aces and that's it, so don't swing with her, but even then, I mean, it's kind of a trade-off, it's kind of just universal, so if you get her in your opening hand, you are golden. If you get two of her in your opening hand, it's a wasted card, especially since she's legendary, so if they blow the first one away, you could start screwing with their head by summoning another one, but really you should be dropping your third mana, dropping an actually good creature, and then mutagenic growth is just there to be the, I don't cost anything, and here's four more damage on double strike guy, so whatever adds up to their current life total, you're good. Now people always ask the same thing. What about a life gain deck? So hit them for 16 like twice. I mean, you know, with Fabled Hero and bolstering and pretty much anything else other than the boost, it's permanent. You're going to get bigger permanently. And Double Strike adds up really, really quickly. So if they thought they were all clever and gained, you know, 12 extra life by turn four or something, I don't really know how effective they really are. You just hit them one additional time and they're dead, or you just wait for one additional Vines of Astwood or one additional Become Immense. 
um, half the time they're, they barely got their combos off and you could just shred them for like 26 instead. You know, if you swing with two guys, both of them brave the elements and then you boost one with a God's willing on a heroic, boost it again with become immense and the mutagenic growth. That is a buttload of damage. That's almost up to 30 in some cases. So it's just not that hard to pile on the damage over and over and over. Now let's say they just go paranoid and do nothing but creature removal and your first three creatures get removed. Okay, just keep top decking, top decking, top decking. Oh, look, a double striker. So you drop in fencing ace. Okay, they're out of removal, or you've got enough pro in your hand at this point that you're good to go, as long as they didn't already kill you. Um, then all you have to do is the very next turn swing, unleash all your mana, everything in your hand, and just kill them. Um, so this deck reloads really, really, really quickly, because technically turn turn three, you bring out the double striker. Okay, turn four, swing, kill them. Or turn 15, you bring out a double striker, turn 16, swing and kill them. It's just easier and more likely to go off and you have more cards in your hand. Now, uh, the one key component of the sideboard, which um, the sideboard is really just not that important because what could you possibly pull in here without screwing up the deck? But Angel's Grace. <laughs> this says you cannot lose the game this turn. So if they have a win on turn four deck, which is kind of the goal in uh, Modern Masters, or not Modern Masters, just Modern, the modern format. All you have to do is play Angel's Grace. You can't lose this turn. Counter swing, you win. I mean, it's just that simple. I've done that so many times. In fact, one time I chained three of them together because I couldn't pull crap. <laughs> and he kept removing my creatures and everything just went terrible. So I left something out on the battlefield and then had to Angel's Grace, Angel's Grace, Angel's Grace, then finally swing for the win because I just could not pull a boost spell. And that was before Mutagenic Growth was in there, so... You know, a little different, but I left Feet of Resistance in there, so I kind of crept up a little bit on the damage and eventually just hit him for like 6, 6, then 8 or something like that. And uh, it kind of did work. So, And just remember, the Mirren uh, Crusader, he uh, has protection from colors, and in my experience, the opponent has no idea what that means. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if my players that I play against are just dumb or something, but like he didn't know that it couldn't be the target. I mean, there's three components of it. Just look up how it works, but your opponent will probably have no idea what that means, how it works. They'll try to target it and then show off a spell and then it'll fizzle and just nothing good can come of it from their lack of knowledge. <laughs> so this is definitely a fun deck. I really, really like it. Um, I hope you guys like it too. And uh, it wins a lot. I mean, universally against any type of deck, any top tier deck, this will win very, very, very often, which is why I'm convinced that it's a tier two deck. So go out there and tear people apart with this completely unknown deck. And uh, if you got a great story about who you beat with it and how mad they got and how many tables they flipped, leave it in the comment section. And I will see you guys soon.